Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel Love Marriage. And I'm Whitney Terrell, author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. Have I mentioned that I don't like Texas? Yeah, just a couple of times. Yeah. I'm from Missouri, live in Missouri, as listeners know, and Missouri has its own very serious problems, as Missourians know, but Texas. Do you know that the University of Texas just blew up the entire Big 12 conference by deciding to bail out and join the SEC? Just blew it up, just left after we had rescued them from, uh, you don't really want to get into all that stuff. Um, although to be honest, I will have to admit that the University of Missouri already blew the Big 12 conference up a bunch of years ago by moving to the SEC. So I don't really have a leg to stand on there. Uh, Minnesota's in the Big 10. Yes, <laughs> which is like where where KU wants to go, I think that's my dad's alma mater and the team that I cheer for around here. Anyway, speaking of Missouri's problems, there are also a bunch of state lawmakers in Missouri who want to pass the exact same kind of abortion law that just passed in Texas, SB8, barring abortions after six weeks and giving $10,000 in civil damages to any citizen vigilante who successfully uh, who successfully sues anyone who quote unquote aids and abets in an abortion from a doctor to a driver. We are not doing that in Minnesota. Let's rub it in. Maybe Missouri is just like, maybe I, Missouri is just Texas without the oil is the problem. That's why I get so mad at Missouri. That's bad, but maybe it's better not to have the oil. Look, either way, it's bad enough that we want to talk about the implications of Texas's new abortion law and the prospect of ending Roe, the, ending the Roe v. Wade era, not just in Texas or Missouri, but across the nation. Later in the episode, we'll talk to Catherine Nurnberger, most recently the author of The Witch of I and Rue. But first, we're going to talk to Elizabeth Wetmore. Beth is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and is the recipient of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and two fellowships from the Illinois Arts Council, as well as a grant from the Barbara Deming Foundation. In addition, she was a Rona Jaffe Scholar in Fiction at Fredloaf and a fellow of McDowell. In the spring of 2015, she was one of six writers in residence at Hedgebrook. Her 2020 novel, Valentine, which we're going to talk about today, is a New York Times bestseller that the Boston Globe called a blast of feminist outrage. Beth, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So we asked you here because you were born in Texas and your novel, Valentine, is set in Odessa, Texas, where you grew up. And we would very politely like to ask you, what the fuck is going on down there? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, such a big question, right? Um, yeah, I think I, I joked in one of my emails, I think I've been asking myself what the fuck is wrong with Texas, you know, since I was about nine years old. Um, but, uh, you know, it, and I was born and raised there. I left when I was 19. Um, so a very young woman. I still have family in that area and I get down there as often as I'm able. Um, I, I, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, SB8, what we're talking about today is just the absolute logical continuation of the war that's been going on down there for decades. Um, you know, I, it's, it's just to say real quickly stands for Senate Bill 8, which is the Texas abortion law popularly now. So please go ahead. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I on September 1st, when I was sort of, you know, scrolling through news in a sort of blind rage, I mean, just for shits and giggles, I went on to one of those websites like, you know, findaclinic.org where you can tap in your address and get a sense of where you can get, you know, an abortion if you should need it. And I went in and put in my, my street address where I grew up in Odessa. And for women in my hometown, you know, the only difference between August the 30th and September 1st is about an extra 150 miles. You know, they were already driving several hundred miles to get an abortion. Um, so, you know, SB8 is awful, <laughs> um, you know, and, and horrifying. Um, but for a lot of women in Texas, uh, the difference between SB8 and pre-SB8 is not really that different. So uh, heartbreakingly. So, and, and of gonna... course, I'm speaking specifically about women in rural areas and poor women. So... So um, we've already done a what the fuck Texas episode. It's kind of starting to be a recurring theme on this show. Um, Whitney has issues with Texas, but uh, you know today we're <laughs> we're going to talk. We're talking specifically, as you mentioned, about SB eight. Uh, yeah, um, the central characters in your novel, and yes, I do have specific issues. I'm sorry, Missouri is kind of a lot like Texas, and this has an inferiority complex. Like we're not quite as terrible, but we're also not good. 
Um, yeah, so, y'all don't have oil money, and that's yeah, kind of a game changer. changer but thing. and honestly, I don't blame anyone for being pissed off at Texas. I'm pissed off at Texas, you know. So, I mean, I'm also, you know, really mindful of, and I've thought about this a lot, you know, that um, I'm in, I'm mindful of the importance of not confusing people with their rulers, <laughs> you know. That's and true. in the case of Texas, which has such a a long history of voter disenfranchisement and suppression and, you know, intimidation, frankly, um, you know, and, and really low voting rates, even before the most recent sort of attacks on people's ability to, you know, vote. I think that there's a, a real, you know, there's a real distinction to be made between the rulers and those who are being ruled, right? Um, so... With, well, speaking... with some notable exceptions of some white women who have, you know, tethered their donkeys to those jackasses because they prefer their status and their money over right you know the right to choose and of course for those women sb8 is a no-brainer right they just get on an airplane in dallas and fly to chicago and check into the hyatt regency and do a little shopping on michigan avenue before their procedure and go home right and that's unfortunately i mean the the real horror of sb8 is the same horror that women have already been living with right which is that you know, if you don't have a reliable car, <laughs> if you can't disappear from your life for a couple of days to drive across state lines, um, you know, if you um, have young children to care for, right? Um, if you don't have any money, right? You're you're really just kind of stuck. But that was true before SB8. So, well, speaking of that history, your novel uh, Valentine is, a, is about the central characters are women living in Texas in 1976, which is just a few years after Roe versus Wade passed, um, and it's referenced in the book, you know, um, you were growing up in Texas at that time. Let's start there. What was the attitude of Texans toward abortion around that time, uh, you know, just a few years after Roe v. Wade was becoming, and before it had been, at least on a national level, politicized in the way that it is now? Um, how do people talk about it when you were growing up, and how, you know, what, what, what were those conversations, or did they talk about it? Well, so in 1976, I was about the same age as DA Pierce. Um, and I honestly don't have very clear memories of that being a topic of conversation at all. In fact, when I was doing the research to see if Mary Rose would actually have had to drive to Albuquerque to get her abortion, you know, um, I had to do a little bit of reading and research into to my old hometown, you know. Um, and, and it was true in 1976, there was not an abortion clinic in, in West Texas. Um, the closest one was in New Mexico. Um, so, or, or, or Austin, but she chooses to go to Albuquerque. It's not that, since it's not that great a difference. I think some of the vastness of Texas is hard for people, I think, to, to totally sort of grasp sometimes. Um, but, you know, I, I don't have clear memories of abortion being a particular topic of conversation in the 1970s. And again, I was a little girl. I was about 10 years old in 1976. What I do have very clear memories of is turning 13 in 1980. And, and the, you know, the beginning of the Reagan years, and suddenly abortion was everywhere in my hometown, in the churches, in group meetings, at the junior league, at schools, and suddenly it did become, you know, a kind of hot topic of conversation. And, um, and, and, and unsurprisingly, because that part of the world has always been deeply conservative and deeply fundamentalist, you know, um, unsurprisingly, the... Um, you know, the general sort of word on the street was that abortion was a terrible thing, that it killed a baby, you know, the usual, the, you know, the, the usual bullshit that prevents women from making choices about their bodies. And I think, you know, there are all kinds of interesting reasons why that, that kind of, um, that kind of anti-woman attitude is so deeply sewn into the fabric there, you know, that's, that, that has to do from the same kind of places, the racism, right, which is, stitched into the fabric from the get-go, so. So you were talking a little bit about the vastness of Texas, and I wanted to talk a little bit about landscape in your book and how it connects to this law and, and to, to SBA, to um, the history that you're talking about. And the very opening scene of your book, uh, we, met, we meet Gloria Ramirez, uh, who's just been assaulted by a man named Dale Strickland, and you describe the landscape she has to walk through to get away from him. And it's it's both beautiful and just horrifyingly bleak. And I wonder if you could describe that area a little bit and, and read us a short description. Sure. 
So the Permian Basin, where the novel had said, is about 86,000 square miles of oil and gas rich land. Um, that's been, you know, kind of a hundred year sort of slow rolling environmental disaster since the, the pen well came in and the, I guess it was 1918. Um, and uh, sparsely populated, um, beautiful and quiet. Um, I agree, it's desolate and bleak. Um, I also happen to fall into the category of people who think that part of the world is lovely. And so I, I, um, I like lonely and bleak places. Um, and I think a lot of people who live out there do. So for me, that, that, that he takes her out into the desert, into the oil patch was, um, not a not a direct attempt at like drawing a parallel between the the land and the oil and gas industry and what happens to her right i mean the truth is he could have taken her anywhere right and this sort of thing happens all the time what's what you know it has less to do with the isolation of the area and more to do with the the lack of care right for a 14 year old latina girl and of course you know the kind of a kind of deeply ingrained um culture of you know men taking what they want mostly with impunity, right? Um, so, but it's beautiful. Um, the Chihuahuan Desert is a major flyover zone for migratory birds. Um, maybe because I've lived most of my life in cities since I left home, as I've gone back over the years, I've come to appreciate, um, you know, the incredible, um, you know, the night sky and the stars and the, the ability to be away from people very quickly, right? I think that's something that's certainly lost in my life here in Chicago. Um, and, and at the same time, the land is also deeply distressed. Um, and of course that's gotten worse and picked up steam with you know, the, the fracking and horizontal drilling that's kind of run amok in the last few years. So, um, so for example, you know, they, um, they are suffering earthquakes down there. You know, um, rates of cancer are a bit higher than the national average. Um, you know, the, the social problems are, you know, um, pretty endemic and, and in spite of billions of dollars flowing out of the Permian Basin every year or every day really, um, they have some of the worst public schools in the state, some of the highest rates of teenage pregnancy. And that has been consistent from the time I was a child to today. So, um, you know, uh, so oh, to that part of the Permian Basin economically is working class, you know, during the best oil boom, the average person in my hometown is just kind of earning a living, right? And of course, the minute there's an oil bust, their, their jobs are gone. Um, and, and, you know, because I often tend to, to frame these things in terms of class, um, one of the things that's been interesting to me is the enormous, um, the enormous disparity between what men earn in Odessa and what women earn. So for example, you know, if you look up Boston, men always earn a little bit more, right? You know, if you, if you look up any place, men always earn a bit more than women. But if you look up, you know, the 2010 census from Odessa, which was a boom, right? You would see that the average salary for a man, the average yearly income for a man was about $51,000. And for a woman, it was 19. So oh my now, God. I know, isn't that horrible? Oh my God. <laughs> and it's totally unsurprising, right? Because the jobs that are available to women in an oil town are waitressing and bartending. You know, um, you know, people, um, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, people going to college was a thing that a few people did, <laughs> not many, right? <laughs> I mean, and you had to drive hundreds of miles to do it, you know. Um, there's a community college in town. Um, but uh and so I think that, you know, the geographical isolation, um, the kind of some things that are sort of inherent to the oil industry, you don't have a lot of women working as roughnecks even today, and you certainly didn't in the 70s. Um, so it's a very male dominated profession. The, the economy of the town does not lend itself to women having good paying jobs that would give them, frankly, right, the freedom to make decisions about their bodies, <laughs> you know, and to, you know, and to, I mean, I, I don't want to put too fine a point on it or sound redundant, but, you know, just the, the, the very simple fact of having a reliable vehicle that can drive you several hundred miles across the desert, right, to get to a healthcare facility is, you know, a daily reality. So it's not an American problem. And I mean, <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah, it just seems like, so yeah, I mean, I live in Minnesota and um, right, so much of care is concentrated in the Twin Cities. Uh, I think people in surrounding states are also coming here and mm -hmm. having to drive so, so far. Um, right. Yeah, and, and 
I just, it's, it's interesting to me also that, um, I don't know, when I think about writing about abuse, writing about sexual assault, um, and I think about sort of like, what is the moral value of the metaphor in this context? Mm -hmm. you're, you're sort of telling me that it, that this is sort of putting this incident in the oil patch is like not sort of part of the, it's, it's, she, he could have taken her anywhere, you said. And it's yeah. interesting because, yeah, I mean, at the same time, you're talking about all of these other kinds of violation. Um, mm -hmm. And I, as a reader, sort of can't help but see um, the isolation of the place, the bleakness, the inhospitable nature of the surroundings, that all of this, mm -hmm. which to me sort of plays into the attack. And, you know, it seems to me like what allows him to get her alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, certainly easier, right? I mean, there's, it's so sparsely populated, particularly once you get out of, you know, out of town, there's nothing out there, right? Um, and at the same time, I mean, um, you know, the land is just the land, right? The land isn't a metaphor for anything. It's just the land, <laughs> you know, it's the people that I was interested in in this book and how they survived and how they, you know, um, sort of, uh, you know, make their way in, in you know, the, the, inhospitable, the inhospitable environment is, is, a, is a human made, right? Um, it's like the industry. I mean, the industry is what creates the disparity between men and women, as you were just uh, outlining, that it's much easier to make money as a man in, a, in, a, in an oil economy than it right. is if you're a woman. Right. Uh, well, sure. And, and of course, the oil and gas industry has had such a stranglehold, you know, on government in that state, really from the get go. I mean, it is written into the Texas Constitution that you cannot do anything on your land that would interfere with oil and gas exploration. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like it is, it is, you know, they, you know, politicians in the state of Texas, Republican and Democrat, you know, get in, you know, enormous amounts of money from the oil and gas industry every year, you know, so they really have a stranglehold on policy. And of course, you know, I, I don't want to sound cranky and, you know, conspiracy theory minded, but, you know, again, it, it is not lost upon me that all of these abortion laws, not just this one, but all of them have always affected, you know, black women, Latinas, poor women, rural women um, with no, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't choose this old fashioned word lightly, but frankly, if, you know, Greg Abbott or, you know, who's his merry little psychopath sidekick, um, uh, Oh God, what's his Lieutenant name? Lieutenant Governor guy. Yeah, um, uh, Ken Paxton, for God's sakes. You know, if their mistresses get knocked up, they'll just throw them on a plane and send them out of state. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to suffer for a moment from these laws. These laws have always, and frankly, I think there's a there's a, a deep interest in in depriving women and people of color of power in that state by keeping them you know, poor and unable to vote and keeping them pregnant, frankly, you know, it works, it works for that system, you know, and my entire hometown is built on a system that works because women don't make a lot of money and they don't have a lot of options. And of course, I'm painting with really broad strokes here. So, and at this, and I also don't want to, you know, I, you know, my hometown is suffering horribly right now. Um, people are dying by the droves in my hometown. Um, from COVID, um, men, you know, most of them unvaccinated, and um, and that's heartrending. Um, you know, so I, I, I hesitate to kick my hometown while it's already down. But more importantly, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, to to be dismissive of the women and girls who have got boots on the ground who are doing the hard work. Um, you know, as we sit here and talk, you know, and I sit here in Chicago, you know, um, and have been for 40 years. Um, you know, on September 1st, again, when I was kind of, you know, rage scrolling, I came across an article from El Paso Matters, um, and it was talking about women along the borderlands and how they've been moving, you know, um, the morning after pill back and forth across the border for decades, right, to help each other. Um, and because the state of Chihuahua is dreadfully, dreadfully conservative, um, you know, and, uh, and the work that they've been doing. And, and the name of the article, I can't remember the name of the article, but it was basically like, you know, border activists, you know, remind us of the resilience, right, of this fight and how long it's been going on. So. Well, the, you're talking about the reality of Texas. There's also the myth of Texas and, you know, that, that, that oil industry and the landscape are the thing that's famously supposed to be the source of Texas's big independent streak, especially when it comes to government interfer interference. Mm -hmm. 
on our last WTF Texas episode uh, was about the power blackouts in Texas, mm -hmm. which were in part caused by the state's insistence on having a power grid that was separate from all the other power grids in the United States. So in order to avoid regulation. So I genuinely and, and sincerely am curious to uh, how, how an effort to turn every Texas citizen into an abortion regulator fits with this ethic of independence. And maybe we can talk about specifically how the law SB8 does that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's a puzzle, isn't it? <laughs> um, and it's and it's incredibly, you know, what what is what is unique about SB8 is the cruelty of it. And I think we've seen a lot of that coming out of Texas in recent months. You know, there seems to be a little edge of cruelty um, to everything from the way people are being treated along the border to the anti-trans kids bills, right? Um, you know, yeah, it just basically, you know, um, puts women in the position of, you know, being afraid to go to their priest or their pastor or their rabbi, right, or their teacher um, or their neighbor, you know, it turns everyone into an enemy and it, and I think it further. Um, Which specifically, we just to say, so the so leaders are following us in case our listeners don't know this, I think most will. That, you know, what the law is doing, the way it's enforcing and, and ending abortion in Texas is that it, it gives people the, it incentivizes people to report anyone who's supposedly assisting in an abortion being right. carried out beyond six weeks. And if they successfully turn the person in, they get $10,000, if I'm understanding the law correctly. Right, right. And, and you know, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, and that's a good argument for civil disobedience, right? I mean, and I hope that's something that I've been very heartened to hear a couple of clinics in recent days talking about how they're going to start to perform abortions again no matter what, and just let the chips fall where they may. And I and I hope that people who have got money to send, <laughs> you know, will do that and and help these clinics, you know, basically do the right thing, which is, you know, to to act in defiance of this law. Um, you know, I think um, guys like Greg Abbott and Ken Paxton get a lot of mileage out of the idea that well-intentioned, thoughtful people of of good, you know, of good of good intention and. Uh, and who want to do the right thing, you know, frequently show up to these fights with knives, right? Where, and they bring guns, right? I mean, to use that old, you know, kind of, I mean, um, we, we show up with, you know, we want to follow the laws, we want to do the right thing. And that gets us every time, right? Because they don't care, right? They don't care if their own citizens die, right? They don't care if poor women die of bot botched abortions. There's no, there's no bottom, right? Um, so, but to get to your question of, you know, the kind of myth of the rugged individual, I mean, what I would say is that, um, again, I mean, I think a lot of that has always been bluster and bullshit and the myth of the rugged individual has always in Texas only applied to a very small group of people. Um, you know, um, you know, the great state of Texas has never encouraged the rugged independence of, you know, black women in Houston, for example, you know, um, they've never encouraged the rugged independence of Latinas, you know, living on, along the borderlands, you know, they've never encouraged the rugged independence of poor white women living in far rural West Texas, you know, so that, that sort of um, fetishizing, right, of rugged independence is, is I think, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, has, has always belonged to a, a very particular group of moneyed, white, mostly male Texans, so. So you've mentioned um, Greg Abbott a couple of times, and um, I think you called Ken Paxton his, his merry psychopath sidekick, which is maybe <laughs> how I will, I think that's actually going to erase his name from my mind, which I welcome. <laughs> and I, I wonder, you know, just he, Greg Abbott said that he wanted to, um, and I'm quoting here, eliminate rape as he signed this law. Um, but that's a very difficult task. Um, and especially in a culture that as your novel shows, design, it's designed to hide and obscure sexual violence. And how did we get from Ann Richards? I mean, I remember growing up reading about Ann Richards. She was governor of Texas from 91 to 95. How do we get from Ann Richards to, to Greg Abbott and his, his merry sidekick psychopath? Well, and I would say too that, um... You know, it, it's it's not just that it's difficult to eliminate eliminate rape in Texas, right? It's it's an it's disingenuous. He doesn't mean it. He doesn't give a shit. You know, I mean, he's 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 saying what he thinks he needs to say, but he doesn't care um, because the system is working very well for him and and all of those with whom he surrounds himself, right? Um, 
So I, I, I think, you know, to talk about eliminating, I mean, how would you eliminate rape in Texas? I mean, you know, you, you know, I, you would have to get rid of people, guys like Greg Abbott, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's disingenuous and, um, and he has no interest in passing any real laws that would actually tighten, you know, um, rape restrictions. I mean, this is, you know, I, 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 it, it, it sounds brutally unkind to a state that I love, you know, but I don't love the leadership to say that um, at the end of the day, they, they just don't care what happens to their people. Right. You know, and by they, I mean the, the autocrats who run the state. Right. When people talk about so Texas goes, so goes the rest of the United States. I mean, I think that um, that that's uh, not an unhelpful way to look at the state of Texas. You know, um, so um, if some of these like anti voting restrictions continue to make their way through the system, you know, I know, Whitney, you're in Missouri and y'all are eyeballing, I think, a similar law to the, the one that's passed in Texas. So, um, oh, yeah, we're going to do you that. Know, but but this idea of keeping people poor, you know, keeping them, you know, um, pregnant, um, you know, it sounds so old school and old fashioned, but, you know, it's very helpful to prop up a system that's very, very, very good to a certain segment of the Texas population. Um, to answer your question about Ann Richards, honestly, I think Ann Richards was a kind of brief shining anomaly in a much larger sort of overall trajectory that is Texas and Texas history. So um, she was great. I wish that there had been more like her. Um, it's, I, it's, I think um, you could argue that, you know, the backlash to her was pretty significant. So, so um, of course, the reason that Abbott, the bizarre successor to Ann Richards, um, is talking about eliminating rape is that the law makes no exceptions for cases of rape or incest and you'd have to carry the child to term and so this you know would happen to your protagonist glory the discussion of incest and rape exceptions are like important in stark ways to discredit a law like that but what is also being lost is the ability of a character like mary rose who is the first person to encounter glory um mary rose uh, wants to get an abortion on her own, not because she was assaulted, but because she doesn't want any more children. Um, you've heard her a little bit earlier driving to Albuquerque. I wonder if you could read us a passage um, about, about that. Sure. So, so this is from, a, this is deep in the book and Mary Rose has, um, she's 25 when the book opens and already has a nine-year-old daughter. And, um, you know, she finds herself uh, driving to Albuquerque because she's pregnant and doesn't want to be. Um, and that's about 350 miles from her, her farm. Um, and so I'll just pick up there. Um, and she has to take her daughter, Amy, with her because she doesn't have anywhere else for her to go. So she basically tells her husband a, a little white lie about going to, to visit um, family, right? And she takes her daughter and she drives from West Texas to Albuquerque. And this, 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 this section begins when, they, um, when they're already at the clinic. This is legal, I keep telling myself, has been for nearly two years, but it was hard to feel that way with a pack of lies, 400 miles in a state line under my belt. I stepped up to the window and spoke as quietly as I could, all while sliding the $300 that I'd taken out of my private savings account across the counter. I might've been buying cocaine, I was so covert. The receptionist smiled and slipped the money into a drawer. She handed me a clipboard and looked over my shoulder at Amy. Mrs. Whitehead, who is driving you home after the procedure? No one, I said, I am driving myself. You need somebody who can drive you home. You have somebody? I drove up from Texas. Ah, I see. She paused and began chewing lightly on her fingernail. Are you spending the night here in town? We're at the Holiday Inn, I said, keeping my voice low. The new one that's downtown, she smiled, speaking a bit more quietly, and I nodded. Okay, good, she said. Some women tried to drive, try to drive all the way back home, and that can cause some complications. You're lucky, she said. You'll be in for about two hours. Two hours. I looked back at my daughter, who was sitting on a chair with a bag of potato chips and her Nancy Drew book. The woman reached across the counter and touched my hand. This happens all the time. We'll keep an eye on her. I stood there blinking hard and trying to bring the woman's hand into focus. Her fingernails were painted the color of pink tea roses and she wore a plain gold band on her left ring finger. Thank you, I said, her name is Amy. To my daughter, I smiled brightly. I'll be back in a jiffy, 
Don't worry, the woman called as I pushed open a swinging door and wa nearly walked into another woman, a patient, standing just on the other side. We're going to have a fine time. Would you like an ice cold Dr. Pepper? She asked my daughter. Yes, ma'am, Amy said. Have fun with the furniture, man, mama. We stopped at Whataburger on our way back to the Holiday Inn. Amy watched cartoons while I threw up in the bathroom and waited for the cramping to pass. The hamburger didn't agree with me, I said when she knocked on the bathroom door. Just give me a few minutes. That afternoon, she swam and played the pinball machines while I sat on a lounge chair and drank a couple of salty dogs. Early the next morning, we headed up to the Sandia Mountains to smell the pine trees, pinion, spruce, fir, juniper. I closed my eyes and imagined us living in a small wooden cottage deep in a forest full of creatures without intent or malice, a place where you might get hurt, but not because anything meant to harm you. Between stopping every hour at a filling station so I could change my pads, and twice more so Amy could throw up some of the candy I had let her eat at the hotel, we didn't get home until nearly midnight. To my daughter, I said, I won't ever ask you to keep anything from your daddy unless it's really important. And this is really important. To my husband, I said, I have a bad yeast infection. Don't touch me for a while. Four months later, I was pregnant again. And this time, hardly believing my own stupidity, I decided to have the baby. Thank you so much. There's something that is now so poignant about that line. This is legal, I keep telling myself. And I wonder if you were thinking about abortion rights being in danger in Texas when you wrote it and, and when did you write it? So yeah, I, I worked on Valentine over many years. And while I don't actually remember exactly the year that I wrote this passage, I think the reality that abortion rights have always been in danger in Texas, you know, has never really been very far from my mind. Um, what was interesting to me about writing that passage was two things. One, that she lies to her daughter too, right? Tells her daughter she's going to see a furniture man. Um, and then the reality of that third unplanned pregnancy, right? And the way Mary Rose has, you know, also internalized this idea, you know, that she's somehow doing something wrong, right? I mean, you know, it, it, you know we, I, we talked a little bit about the practical implications of you know, having to drive 350 miles to access healthcare that you're legally entitled to, right? Um, but, you know, I've thought a lot, particularly in, in recent weeks about the psychological effect of women and girls, you know, sneaking out of the state, right? And, and what that does, you know, and of course the, the vagaries of fertility, right? Um, you know, um, that, that one could have an abortion and find oneself pregnant again in four months. And, and you know, and the way that, that Mary Rose sort of turns that on herself, her own stupidity is what's landed her there instead of like the circumstances of her life, you know? And of course, she's also a very young woman, right? I mean, she's, she had her first child when she was 16, 17 years old, so. Uh, one of the things I love about that passage is we're having this discussion and we, as, as we did at the beginning of this interview, about how difficult it is to make the long drive and do, you know, like how, you know, but, but it's hard to feel that, right. Or to mm -hmm. understand how it might apply in your own life. And, and the little things that are in that passage, the, you know, the trying to figure out, Oh my God, I didn't think about how to get someone to, to drive me home. Right. Okay. What's going to happen with my daughter? How do I, I have to lie to her. Nobody likes lying to their kids or asking their mm -hmm. kids to lie for them. When the daughter says, have a good time with the furniture man, you know, or whatever that, right. you know, all of those things are extremely painful. I, I imagining telling, doing all of those things, manipulative things for a thing that you have every right to do and that's legal, right? right? Is one of those, is one of the things that we're really discussing about here, but I think literature gets at in a way that facts right. don't. Well, and something I was aware of, even as I was writing it, was how incredibly lucky she was, right? I mean, I remember when I wrote that line that they checked into the Holiday Inn, I was like, well, shit, they get to go to the Holiday Inn and spend the night, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. they've got the money to do that, right? I mean, this is a this is a heartrending scene, and I'm not discounting, you know, Mary Rose's son, my character suffering because it's real and true. But and she's throwing a, up in the bathroom and she doesn't she have anyone to support her and she has to tell her kid, oh, it's no big deal. It's no problem. Right. I mean, that would be hard. That's not an it's easy terrible. thing to do. You know, and at the same time, she has a private savings account, right? I mean, she's got a good car. I mean, so it's heartrending. And at the same time, in a lot of ways, what makes it even more heartrending to me is that she would actually kind of count among the lucky ones, right? That she could pull this off in the first place, and that's, you know, I mean, there are there are young women and and 
girls in my home state this minute who are, you know, staring down motherhood because they just can't figure out a way to fucking get out of there. And that's heartrending. So this atmosphere of sort of male control of women uh, runs throughout the book. We're not talking a lot about the trial at the end because we're not going to give things away. We'll let people read about that stuff at the end. But um, nearly every woman who's voiced, even someone like uh, Corinne, who puts on a, a good front, um, has been assaulted by a man in one way or another. Um, but the book also seems to imagine ways to resist this through the connections between these women. women. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted... You know, I mean, obviously the, the the scenes of abortion, and there's another one that happens very late in the book where a young woman does not get out of town, right? And she ends up becoming a mother at the age of 17, you know. Um, but of course, what I was more interested in the book is, you know, how these characters, um, many of whom were at least originally based on women I listened to growing up, right, as a little girl, women who were in my orbit, you know, how they, in spite of all that, right, they, they manage to, to, you know, dream of things larger for their own daughters, you know, they, they manage to help each other out, flawed as they are, um, you know, the, the small kindnesses, the way Glory's family cares for her, right, um, you know, um, and, and a kind of, you know, um, I mean, you know, a real reimagining, I think, of what we see when we think of Texas. And by we, I mean people who don't live there and people who read these news stories and are horrified and say, you know, what the fuck is wrong with Texas, which is a good question, you know. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of these characters are not unusual and the care and women like my characters have been fighting for a really long time. You know, one of the things that we talked about very briefly um, we're going to talk about is, you know, under SB8, if Glory had been pregnant from her rape, she would have had to carry that child, right? Um, but maybe not, you know, maybe she would have gotten in touch with a small group of intrepid women in her hometown, right, who would have whispered to one another and made phone calls late at night and gotten her the help she needed, right? Maybe her uncle would have been, maybe she would have been able to drive out of state, um, or if she were a different kind of character, maybe she would have become a parent but I'm, I'm so mindful that, you know, that there are organizations and groups down there and individuals, you know, who have been fighting this fight for a really, really long time. Um, and, and so when I think about, you know, resistance and, and, you know, and the women in my book and, and the women in the state now, you know, I think a, a lot about the, the boots that have been on the ground for a very long time doing this every day, you know. You sent us a really good article that was an example of this from The Atlantic from 2016 about Karen Hildebrand, mm -hmm. who's the CEO of Planned Parenthood in West Texas. Uh, we'll include that in the show notes. But so this has been going on for a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, Planned Parenthood in Midland, you know, just started performing abortions in what was it, 1995? You know, um, and they're gone now. They've been driven out. <laughs> Um, and, and women in my hometown, Odessa, 23 miles away, had to drive to Midland. And one of the things that was interesting to me about that article, and again, this is not 1976, this is 1995, you know, the Clinton years, you know, I mean, when, you know, all was groovy, you know, and when it came to certain things, you know, women's rights, I guess, kind of, I mean, I don't know, and now I'm just blabbing, but, um, Didn't but work my so point good is, for Monica is that, and you know, that the, the, the abortion clinic that opened mid in Midland opened in 1995 and hung on, you know, um, until 2012, right? And they were only doing abortions a couple of days a week, and the women they were servicing were still having to drive in from hundreds of miles away, right? Because Midland and Odessa is geographically isolated as it is. It's less geographically isolated than, say, women who live down by Presidio or Marfa, um, you know, or um, Stanton, right? I mean, it's, if you look at a map of West Texas, it's freaking enormous and there's not much out there. So women were already driving in, you know. Um, and of course, the harassment those women endured was fascinating to me, you know, um, death threats, right? Um, you know, people turning their children, telling their children that their mommies were murderers. I mean, it's just, you know, this is, this is, SB8 is not nothing, is nothing new really. So, I mean, I think a lot of my girlfriends here in Chicago would disagree with me, but you know, I, it's, it's not really much different than what's already been going on there. So, 
Um, well, Beth, this has been such a helpful glimpse into that deeper history. And I, I do think, you know, as I read the news and I see the the sort of beginnings of defiance or beginnings of open defiance, mm -hmm. um, you know, doctors like the one who wrote that op-ed in the post, um, mm -hmm. you know, or other clinics that you mentioned saying that they will be providing abortions, that also seems to me very Texan. And the way that the story moves from Glory and immediately to, to Mary Rose, and then the way that we see other women standing up for Glory, um, as there's a set of men who are, um, you know, hellbent on sort of characterizing her as a woman instead of a child, or, you know, ask yeah. the, the ways in which um, there's something so also terrifying about reading the story set in 1976 and recognizing all of these strategies, the ways that particularly, um, women and girls of color are faulted for their own sexual assaults. And, um, and, but then the way that this sort of circle of women, the structure of the book reflects that the, the strength that you're referring to in, in terms of resistance, um, which was something about the book that, that I really appreciated. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm really hopeful that some um, white women of means in Texas, more white women of means in Texas will start putting themselves on the line and being able to being willing to make the same kinds of sacrifices that Black women and Latinas have been making for a really long time in that state. So. Thank you very much. And we will encourage our listeners to go out and pick up a copy of Valentine. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.